All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with today's program. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. My name is Kimberly Mankus. I'm one of the health educators at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at MGH. And my name is Mariam Daib. I am also a health educator here at the Blum Center. Thank you. And today's program is a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Hospital for Children. And please note, I'm just going to go over a few housewarming items before we get started. So this session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you are interested in viewing this recording, it will be made available on the Blum Center website, as well as the Mass General Hospital YouTube channel after today. You are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted to eliminate background noise so that we can hear our speaker. If you have a question, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Only the Blum Center staff and the co-hosts will see your questions and we'll have time at the end of the session for them. Please don't share any medical personal information or questions in the chat. And if you have a medical question, please do ask your doctor. And next I'm gonna turn it over to Brianna Beckbold. She is the project manager and editor for Mass General Hospital for Children. And she is going to introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Great, thanks Kim. So good afternoon, I hope you're all doing well and thank you for coming to this virtual session of the MGHFC Parenting Series where experts share their knowledge with patients, family and staff on various pediatric health topics. So this year we're co-hosting the series with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. And like Kim said, my name is Brianna Beckbold and I'm a project manager and editor at Mass, uh, Mass General Hospital for Children, which is the pediatric branch of Mass General. And today we have with us Dr. Ann Fischel of Child and Adolescent Psychology, or excuse me, Psychiatry with us to discuss the Family Dinner Project. It's a nonprofit initiative started in 2010 that champions family dinners as an opportunity for family members to connect with each other through food, fun, and conversation about things that matter. Dr. Fischel will also share tips to help make your, uh, help bring your family together and make more meaningful connections around the dinner table. So before we begin, I'd want to uh, briefly introduce our speaker. And today we have Dr. Ann Fischel, who is a child and adolescent psychologist at Mass General Hospital for Children, mm -hmm. where she provides couples therapy, family therapy, and individual psychotherapy. She earned her PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and she's the co-director of the Family, uh, family Dinner Project and director of the Family Therapy Program at Mass General. So, Dr. Fischel will present until around 1245, at which point we'll take questions from the audience in the chat box. So from here, I will hand it off to Dr. Fischel. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about a topic that's, I think is so important um, and maybe even more important during these difficult pandemic days. Uh, I'm just gonna share my slides here. So hold on one second. Um, okay, so I'm a family therapist, uh, as well as a individual and couples therapist. But I'm only half joking when I say I could almost be out of business as a family therapist if more families had regular family dinners. And I'm going to kind of back that assertion up in just a moment, but I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I became so involved in family dinners um, in my professional life. And it really started in my personal life. Uh, I grew up having family dinners and really enjoyed that, those and learned, I think, a lot of skills of being a family therapist, how to listen, how to deflect conflict, how to tell stories. But when my second son was born, my husband gave up smoking and I thought, what can I do to bring a little joy to his life? And I committed myself to providing one good meal a day I had two little boys at that point, and I, what I hadn't anticipated is that they would enjoy um, puttering around in the kitchen with me, helping to stir the soup or pull basil leaves off of stems. And uh, as they became stakeholders in the dinner, they became adventurous eaters as well. 
And that turns out to be something that um, I've learned over and over again, that when kids can participate, it makes them much more likely to want to eat what, whatever is on offer. Um, and then about 20 years later, I had a kind of epiphany in my professional life. I have a home office that sits below my kitchen. Um, and one night I had popped a roast chicken into the oven, uh, knowing that after an hour of family therapy, I would come upstairs and join my family for dinner. Well, that night I was seeing a father and a teenage son who were very tense, they were barely talking, and about halfway through the hour, we all started to smell the garlicky, lemony chicken deliciousness wafting through my air vents. And I felt a little embarrassed that my private life was intruding on my professional life. And then to make matters worse, the teenage son turned to me and he said, could we stay for dinner? And I thought, oh no, not only can you not stay for dinner, but I'm messing up your dinner hour. You're going to probably have fast food on your way home. And I thought, gosh, we should just stop the session right now. I'll give you two a cookbook. You can go cook a, a meal together and eat it. And you'll probably be better off than sticking out this hour with me. Well, I didn't do that. I kept that little fantasy to myself. But I did go on to co-found the Family Dinner Project, uh, which I'll tell you about, and to write a book called Home for Dinner. Um, <clears throat> but the research really uh, bears me out um, when I wanted to send that family home to have family dinner. It turns out that there are 25 years of research that show that family dinners are great for the body, the brain, and the mental health of families, of kids and adults. Um, in terms of the academic benefits, when kids eat dinner, this is particularly for young kids, the vocabulary they hear around the dinner table is 10 times more unusual and richer than the vocabulary that comes from reading aloud to young kids. And when kids have more robust vocabularies, they learn to read earlier and more easily than kids with slimmer vocabularies. And kids of all ages, from elementary school through high school, get better grades when they have regular family dinners. And that effect is even more powerful than doing homework or uh, participating in art or sports. And in terms of the nutritional and uh, physical benefits, there are just so many. Um, family dinners tend to be uh, higher in fruits and vegetables and protein and fiber and lower in sugar and salt um, and fat. Um, they're associated with improved fitness, um, with better cardiovascular health in young teens. And these benefits extend to young adulthood so that kids who grew up having family dinners, once they're out on their own, tend to eat more healthily and have lower rates of obesity. And then the mental health benefits are just a bonanza of, um, of powerful effects. Regular family dinners are associated with lower rates of substance abuse and tobacco use, of violence, of behavioral problems in school, of eating disorders, of early sexual behavior in teens, of anxiety and depression and stress. And on the plus side, they're associated with greater resilience and self-esteem and kids feeling more connected to their parents. So you can see why I was, I've been so moved um, to try to bring more families to the dinner table because aren't these many of the same benefits that I try to create as a family therapist. So you might be asking, why could family dinner do all this? Um, and I would say that it is really the quality of the family time that's key. The secret sauce is not that perfectly roasted roast chicken. The secret sauce is the atmosphere around the table. If it's warm and welcoming, if kids feel that what they have to say is worth listening to, 
if everybody has a chance to relax and maybe laugh a little bit, that's what provides the benefits that I was describing. I think the nutritional benefits come from the slowing down um, that comes when you're talking and eating rather than zoning out in front of the TV. And if you slow down, then you're less likely to eat um, just in a uh, kind of mindless way. In 21st century America, mealtime, particularly family dinner, is really the most reliable time of the day that we have to connect with one another. You know, it's not like we farm together anymore or uh, quilt on the front porch. No, the mealtime is really um, the time to connect. And when kids feel a bond, when they feel a connection to their parents, that's like a seatbelt. Uh, it's like a protective mechanism on the potholed road of childhood and adolescence. Um, so let's just look at some of these uh, reasons for why family dinner is so important. Um, it's a chance to catch problems when they're small and um, uh, for parents to know what's going on in their children's lives. Um, as I was saying, the secret sauce is the conversation. Um, and I'm going to sprinkle sort of throughout the talk some ideas about how to enliven conversation. Um, as a family therapist and as a parent with my own kids, it can be tedious and it can be a kind of a showstopper just to rely on the question, how was your day? You know, often kids will say it was fine, it was okay. And that doesn't really get you too far. So I'm a, a big believer in using games as a way to lighten the mood, but also to encourage um, conversation. So one such game is Rose, Thorn, and Bud, um, where everybody goes around the table and says a rose from their day, which is something positive or funny. A thorn is something difficult or challenging. And a bud is something that you hope will happen tomorrow. And this sort of levels the playing field. It gives everybody a chance to say something about their day, parents and kids alike, and also invites both positive and negative feelings. Or tell a story about your own day first. I've, I've always found if you tell a story first, um, it's much more likely that that will elicit a story from somebody else around the table. Keep a, a map in your head about what your child or your spouse was doing that, that day so that you can ask in a informed and attentive way. Um, I know you had a rehearsal today, or I know um, you were gonna have a challenging breakout on your Zoom call, planning a debate. How did that go? Or how did your big presentation at work go? Um, and of course, making sure that everybody gets a chance to speak without having to compete with conversations that are going on um, via text or uh, email with people who aren't at the table. Family dinner is a ritual and um, it's something that has a kind of a continuity and a stability that gets repeated uh, maybe night after night or maybe once a week. Um, but I think during the pandemic in particular, we've never needed these rituals more than we do now. They're kind of quirky ways that we have of coming together. You know, who sits, sits where at the table, what we talk about, what we eat, um, what topics are allowed and what, which ones are kind of discouraged. Um, what we do when food shows up that somebody doesn't like all these quirky ways that we have of making a meal together um, remind us who we are as a family. And I think this is as important to adults as it is to kids. Um, it really gives us some sense of identity as well as continuity. Um, and food, of course, is a, a powerful metaphor, sometimes for love, sometimes for control, sometimes for nurture. 
another thing that's really powerful um, that can happen at the dinner table is that this can be a place that we tell stories. And stories are really the way that we make sense of the world. And there's a whole body of research uh, that came out of the Emory Center um, in Atlanta that suggests that kids who know their family stories are more resilient and have higher self-esteem than kids who don't know those stories. And I think that's because stories about Aunt Sadie or Uncle George um, help kids feel that they're part of something bigger than themselves and allow kids to know that there are lots of ways that uh, a, a life story can go. You, it's not just the way a parent's life has gone, but there are other trajectories that uh, we can learn from. Um, so sometimes parents will say, but well, what kind of stories should we tell? Um, and there, you know, there's so, so many. Um, these could be your own stories. This could be stories about grandparents who, stories you know about grandparents when they were the same age as your children, animal stories, uh, stories about overcoming a challenge, about moving to a new city or a new country, a love story, a funny story, a story about how you chose your child's name or how your name was, was chosen. Um, this is uh, an ice cream cake that my mother used to make. And she was an artist and didn't really like to spend very much time in the kitchen. She liked to get right to the table to talk. And when I make this ice cream cake, I think of her because it's very, very quick. I can make it in about 10 minutes. Um, and I always like to tell a story about her um, and I think, often our favorite recipes connect to family members, um, maybe who are no longer with us. Tell us again about Monet, Grandpa. Just a funny take on stories that a, a grandfather frog might tell. Um, kids who know how to tell stories also do better uh, as readers. And there's some research that suggests ways to encourage kids to tell better stories, um, coaching them to ask more or having you ask more why and how questions as they're telling a story rather than um, yes or no questions, or reminiscing with your child about a past experience you've shared, sort of retelling a story with your child, um, including feelings in the stories. Kids who were given these instructions had bigger vocabularies and told more complex stories a year later. Now you might be wondering, what is she talking about when she says family dinner? Um, and I just wanna say, I'm not talking about uh, a 50s version of a family dinner with a mother at home, uh, cooking a pot roast all day in a spotless kitchen. A family dinner is really any two people. Um, not everybody is needed to get the benefits that uh, I've talked about from the research. It doesn't even have to be a home cooked meal. It can be takeout. Um, it could be using some shortcuts. It's best not to have the TV on because that seems to encourage less mindful eating, but having some gadgets on where you might use them to clarify some information that's in dispute, um, that would be okay. Talking is better than silence. You don't really get the benefits if everybody talks, sits in stony silence. Um, and although, although the research says that five times a week is the sort of gold standard for getting all the benefits, um, really, I think, any family dinner, even if it's once a week, if it's a really good experience, that's going to confer um, a lot of benefit to your family. And if you have one great family dinner, that's probably going to encourage more family dinners. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It could be very quick. It could be, um, as I said, food made uh, from uh, a rotisserie chicken that you bought at the supermarket. 
And there's new, newish research that suggests that the benefits come to adults as well, um, which is good to hear because it's a lot of work to get dinner on the table each night, the shopping, the cooking, the cleaning. Um, but there are mental health benefits that have been shown for mothers and fathers who have regular family dinners, greater self-esteem, lower levels of depression and stress, and healthier eating, more fruits and vegetables. And this is true across the, the lifespan. So um, I think that families know intuitively that family dinner sounds like a good idea. And in fact, when thousands of families are surveyed, parents, 90, more than 90% of parents say that they want to have family dinners. But in reality, only 30 to 40% of parents are currently having family dinners together. And it was around that <clears throat> discrepancy that the Family Dinner Project was developed. So the idea is to help more families um, access these wonderful benefits by making family dinners um, simpler, easier, uh, more meaningful, and more fun. So the research is why I co-founded the Family Dinner Project. Um, and I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about how we, how we work. So we're based at the Psychiatry Academy now at Mass General. And <clears throat> we have dozens, hundreds of free resources available at our website, thefamilydinnerproject.org. This is one called uh, Dinner Tonight, and you can sign up for it free and get it delivered every day of the week. It includes a recipe that takes less than 30 minutes to make, a game to play, and a conversation starter. And we also have a budget-friendly uh, version where the recipes are $1.40 per person, which comports with SNAP and WIC guidelines. Um, we also have a monthly newsletter that has um, goes into a little bit more depth with a, a theme or celebrates a season or uh, has helpful ideas for gathering uh, during times of pandemic or with um, Halloween or Thanksgiving. And then dozens and dozens of conversation starters. We also wrote a book that came out a few months ago called Eat, Laugh, Talk <clears throat> that's based on the 10 years of working with families through the Family Dinner Project. Um, and it's 52 weeks of stories about families overcoming the common obstacles to family dinner with recipes, games, and conversation starters. And then we do community-based events. And I'm just going to highlight one of them, um, community dinners, where we gather, we <clears throat> get Excuse me, just let me take one sip of water. <clears throat> We've been invited to um, cafes, to libraries, homeless shelters, after school programs, clinics, military bases, and groups of families will come together, anywhere from five to 50 families. We'll cook together, we'll eat together, we'll play games. We'll have interesting conversation, you know, all the things that make for a great dinner. And the idea is to um, kickstart a dinner practice in a community and for parents to um, inspire and learn from one another. So this was one we did through the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. <clears throat> um, and then at the, near the end of each dinner, we have the kids go off and make uh, a dessert with a team member. And one of us will gather with the parents and will ask, as I wish I could ask you if we were in a smaller interactive group, I would say, what do you do well right now when it comes to family dinner? And what are your obstacles? And then I would invite the parents to share the solutions that they've already come up with to overcome common obstacles. Um, 
and I would share some of the solutions, the real life hacks that I've heard from hundreds of families as I've um, met with families across the country. And wherever I go, um, I hear the same obstacles. We don't have enough time to make dinner. We're too busy to sit down together. Somebody is a picky eater and it's just not very much fun to cook four different meals for all these different palates. There's too much tension at the table um, and we're too distracted with technology. So if any of these sound familiar at your table, I just want to <clears throat> share some of the workarounds that we've heard from other parents. Um, so one of them is we're too distracted by technology. And <clears throat> one family that we met with uh, was a divorced dad named Scott who had three sons and he had his kids with him every weekend and he very much wanted to have dinner with them, make dinner and eat with them. But they would scarf down their food and then go to their separate rooms and to their separate screens. So one night he said to them, humor me kids, come to the kitchen, let's cook something and I have an idea tonight. So they came, they made ratatouille over pasta and he sat them down and he started to play the film Ratatouille. He said, if you can't beat him, join him. Um, and he would turn the film off and he would say, you know, how does our Ratatouille compare to the Ratatouille in the, uh, in the film? Sometimes he would turn the film off and ask them to critique a, a certain scene. And in this way, um, he brought technology to the table, but in a way that really encouraged conversation. Um, so I think there, there are ways to be flexible about technology. Uh, I think particularly during the pandemic, when we're looking for ideas to make uh, dinner a little bit easier and to change it up, uh, dinner and a movie can be a, a great way to do that. Um, the Family Dinner Project partnered with Common Sense Media, and we have a whole bunch of films that can be really interesting and fun to watch at the dinner table with um, recipe ideas and conversation ideas to go with that. We're too busy is another common lament uh, from families and some real life hacks we've heard are to make double batches on the weekend and freeze some of them so that you've got something ready made uh, to just defrost. We've heard uh, working with military families, <clears throat> uh, a dinner swap where each parent makes four times the meal that they'll need that night and then they all meet and swap their meals and walk away from the swap with uh, five meals for the rest of the week. Um, cook quick food, not fast food, but quick food like um, soup and sandwich or breakfast foods. Consider all the meals that are a possibility. There are really 16 opportunities in a week to have a shared meal time. Uh, seven breakfasts, seven dinners, two weekend lunches, and an intentional snack where you um, meet at maybe nine o'clock pushing back from homework and work at the computer to have a, a cup of hot chocolate and some, some fruit. Um, so, you know, if dinners are too hectic a time, breakfast or any of these other meal times would work just as well. Um, and thinking that the average family dinner is only 20 or 22 minutes. Um, so it, it need not be a, an elaborate affair to um, incur these, these benefits. Um, picky kids, picky eaters, picky spouses, or selective eaters is um, another very common obstacle. And I think the best advice I ever heard was from a nutritionist named Ellen Satter, who said, parents should decide what to eat, where to eat it, and when to eat, but it's up to kids to decide how much. Um, and I think what she's really getting at here is that the less 
said about the food, um, the better. Um, the less that parents cajole or bribe or promise, the better. And in fact, when parents say things like, eat your peas and then you can have dessert, that is sort of a double whammy, that it makes the peas less desirable and it makes the dessert more desirable. Um, modeling your enjoyment, mm, this is so delicious, um, is also a, a good uh, technique. Um, kids who play with their food, who rub oil on vegetables that then get roasted in the oven or play with dough to make um, pretzels, this kind of tactile encounter with food has also been associated in scientific studies with being more amenable to trying new foods. And as I said earlier in the talk, any time that kids can participate, whether it's choosing a vegetable or stirring the soup or helping to cook in some other way or picking a herb off the windowsill or cleaning up, any of these um, ways of participating make them more likely to want to eat um, what is served. Pediatricians have told me that snacking uh, is a big culprit, that if kids are snacking all day, of course they don't arrive at the dinner table very hungry. Um, customizing a central meal like this Cambodian uh, chicken soup where each member of the family can customize it, but the person who's cooked for the night only has to make one main meal. I started my vegetarianism for health reasons, then it became a moral choice, and now it's just to annoy people. Of course, there are other reasons to be selective eaters to um, uh, creating your identity or for political reasons or for moral reasons. And then tension at the table um, is another common obstacle. Um, and here, I really want to emphasize the, the role that play can have, playing with food, but also playing games. Um, so this was something from a community dinner where we had all the fixings for a salad laid out and everybody took what they wanted and then made <clears throat> a face or a house or a car. And the only rule is that you have to eat what you play with. Um, this is a Raggedy Ann salad. It's sort of the same idea. This is a recipe from Eat, Laugh, Talk. Uh, playing with space, uh, mixing it up. Usually family members sit in the same chair every night. So what's it like to take a different seat or to spread a blanket out on the living room floor and um, have dinner there or have dinner outside? We're playing with science. Um, you can change the, the length of time that you cook something or um, as I've seen kids spend hours doing pickling experiments, adding different kinds of acids or sugars to all kinds of food from cucumbers to avocados to ice cream to strawberries. And that sort of trial and error and having a hypothesis and then checking it out is really the essence of being a, a scientist. So um, I wanna say a little bit about uh, some ideas that we've come up with in response to the pandemic um, and also thinking ahead to Thanksgiving, um, which is a topic that's been coming up many, many times a week in my family therapy practice. Um, so first about the pandemic, uh, our ideas about the pandemic, because uh, never, I think, uh, at least in my lifetime, have families been spending so much time together and um, having more, not only dinners together, but breakfast and lunch. So one thing that we've been doing is sharing our resources with uh, community programs. Since we can't do community dinners in real time during the pandemic, we've sort of pivoted 
to sharing our, um, our resources with um, Feed the Children, uh, the Idaho Office of, of Drug, Drug Policy, and other organizations, so that when these emergency uh, food boxes are delivered, our resources, we hope, will help with some of the bonding and the enjoyment around the dinner table. We created a stuck at home guide um, that's on our website. It's available in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. And since it's gotten even more tedious than usual to ask, how was your day when we're spending much of our days together, we tried to think of some uh, additional ways to liven up dinner. I've also already mentioned dinner and a movie. Um, another idea is to have a conversation jar on your table. Um, and we have dozens and dozens of conversation starters uh, that you can stuff in that jar and then pull out when um, conversation lags. And their games, um, instead of rose thorn and bud, you might play cactus and a bud, since it's, sometimes it's hard to come up with something positive that happened. So you might talk about things that were tough today, the, the thorns on a cactus and a bud, what we hope will happen um, when the pandemic is over or what we look forward to um, next week. Two truths and a tall tale. Um, go around the table and say two things that happened today and one thing that I'm making up and have people guess what that is. That really encourages some storytelling around the table. Or this question, this game, um, 20 questions about a family memory where each person thinks of a family memory and then others ask yes, no questions to try to guess what that memory is. You know, did it happen on vacation? Did it happen at a holiday? Was anybody crying? Were we younger than 10? Um, and eventually the memory will get guessed. And it's a way, I think, of reminding fa families that um, we have a, an album of memories. It seems like we've been in this pandemic for our whole life, but actually we have a history that we can bring back and, and flip through. And I think it gives parents a chance to highlight memories that they might want their kids to think about. And it allows parents to find out what kinds of memories are top of mind for their kids. So these are some of the conversation jar stuffers. Um, if you had a superpower, what would it be and how would you use it to help people? Um, name two things you feel thankful for. Uh, what book ca character would you like as a friend? Um, what's your earliest memory? And as I said, there are countless more. Um, so as we think ahead to Thanksgiving, um, this is going to be, a, I think, a tough Thanksgiving for m many, many families across the country. Um, it's going to be post-election. Who knows what that's going to look like? Um, and many families will decide that it's not safe to gather together. So um, there may be more conflict and tension from the results of the 2020 election. And there will probably be more virtual Thanksgiving meals. So just a couple of thoughts about the conflict. <clears throat> I think some families may want to um, preemptively try to keep conflict off the table, perhaps by sending an email to everybody who's going to come, uh, setting the tone, saying this is a year that we really want to focus on um, what we love about this family or what we're grateful for uh, and try to keep our political differences at bay. Or if that doesn't work, perhaps switching seats between courses so that a tense topic with uh, Uncle George can be uh, diffused by switching seats. Or uh, a game that I came up with 
in 2016, which if you'll remember was also a very contentious Thanksgiving for a lot of families across the country. So I was worried at my own Thanksgiving table that there would be a lot of heated conflict. Um, and I wanted at least a few minutes of uh, genial, playful conversation. And so I came up with the hat game and it, it went like this. And I actually, I've continued to play it each, each year. I put a hat at the door and a bunch of post-its and as people came in, I had a prompt for them. One year it was, what was your favorite toy or what is your favorite toy? Um, what, another year it was, uh, what character in a children's book did you most admire or do you most admire? Another year it was, what was your earliest memory? And I would ask them to fill out, to answer that question anonymously pop the post-it in the hat and then I brought the hat to the table and I'd pull out the post-its and give the answers and then people would try to guess which answer went with which person. And sometimes that was all it was but sometimes somebody would say why they picked Harriet the Spy as the character they most admired or um, somebody would talk about the slinky as the game, as the toy that they most enjoyed. And the conversation would go off in a, a different direction. Um, and then another idea uh, is to uh, redirect a political conversation to a historical one. Um, and instead of talking about this vote, do you remember your first vote? Or do you remember other times when the country felt polarized? Um, can you imagine what the first Thanksgiving after it was proclaimed in the depths of the Civil War was like? Um, so um, maybe more, even more, I don't know, even more, it's just as pressing. We may not have as much conflict because we're not gonna be getting together, a lot of us, uh, in, in real time. Um, so what might Thanksgiving look like if it's virtual? Of course, have to think about food at Thanksgiving. Um, and I know I've floated with my sons who sadly I think will not be able to gather with me for the first time ever. Um, we've talked about cooking our turkeys separately together and Com comparing tips and how it's going as, as the afternoon progresses. I've heard other families think about using this as an opportunity to teach a family recipe. Um, another family told me that they were gonna all meet uh, with side dishes, sort of like military families do. And um, each family member was gonna make a side dish, but make five times it. Yet. So, five containers of mashed potatoes or five jars of cranberry sauce and then swap them so that each family member would leave with a whole Thanksgiving dinner. I heard of other families who were just taking a pass, a pause on Thanksgiving altogether. Um, they're gonna get takeout food, they're gonna make Sundays, they're gonna, they're gonna binge watch a whole bunch of movies um, I've heard families say, okay, we can live with this disruption, but will you please promise that this won't be a permanent rupture? That even though this is going to be weird and strange and <clears throat> we're not going to get together, can we be back here next year? Um, I think there's some games that might be fun to play virtually. Um, movie quotes where you give a quote and family members try to guess which movie it goes with or humming a song and you have to guess what song is being hummed um, or sharing family history. Uh, which one in our family uh, was a, a pilot in World War II? Which one um, joined the circus when they were 20? Um, 
and to have different family members share these details and see if others can guess uh, who, which family member goes with that detail. And then finally, we've come up with a virtual care package for families who are gonna be apart this year or Thanksgiving in a box um, that you can find on our website. Uh, and here you might download the resources that you think would be fun for your family and send them or just send them virtually as a link. Um, these include a, a, a recipe card where you uh, write the recipe of a Thanksgiving um, recipe and then there are questions to ask about that recipe. Um, Thanksgiving conversation starters. We have some uh, Thanksgiving would you rather uh, funny questions um, for, you know, Thanksgiving edition, would you rather to play? So um, I feel like I've sort of raced through um, a lot right here. And I just want to um, kind of in conclusion, just say just a few summarizing remarks. And then I'd, I hope there will be some comments or questions or ideas that that you have about um, how you encourage conversation or ways that you're thinking about this um, unusual Thanksgiving ahead. I think that family dinner is a ritual that we need now more than ever um, because it gives us stability, it gives us continuity, uh, and it reminds us who we are as a family. But any ritual to stay vital, to stay interesting, has to be able to bend and accommodate to make um, to the changes in the family and in the outside world. The pandemic has brought many such challenges. We have many more meals to make. There's so much more stress. There's loss, there's frustration, there's sadness that of course shows up at the dinner table. And there's a lot less new information that comes in from the outside world since we're spending so much more time together. But the upside is, and there's uh, surveys that um, demonstrate this, families are having more dinners and more meals with one another. Kids are cooking more and learning to cook more during the pandemic. And I think more families are discovering some of the, the pleasures and the benefits of this very simple, mundane um, thing, family dinner. Um, and my hope is that after the pandemic, um, that some of this will continue um, even after we're out in the world and um, able to um, not having breakfast and lunch and dinner all together. Um, I hope I've given you maybe one or two ideas of how to change up um, the conversation through games or movies or other ideas, ways to you know, in include technology perhaps at the table. Um, and um, anyway, I hope uh, that family dinner is a interesting and um, mostly enjoyable time in your homes. So, and with that, I'm gonna stop and see what questions there might be. Great, thank you, Anne. We did have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, one was, can the resources that you shared uh, be shared in the chat box? But because this is recorded, I don't think the chat box is the best place to share. But if there is some other uh, place mm -hmm. or a list that you can think of um, where everyone can access it, that would be great. Sure, I mean, I would just say, if you go to the website, which is the all one word, thefamilydinnerproject.org. <clears throat> and um, you can either click on the pandemic resources or click on the um, con this Thanksgiving resources. They're Great. on the homepage of the website right now. Perfect. Um, 
And then a uh, second question, do you have any suggestions for toddlers who eat a different meal because of nutrition reasons or other ideas for games or um, ways to include toddlers uh, you know, around the table? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. And <clears throat> having family dinners with toddlers, well, it's, uh, it's, it's a messy time for family dinners. It's a great time to start the practice of um, having regular family dinners. So, you know, I think setting expectations realistically is an important thing. If a toddler is able to sit for five minutes, that's a win. You know, I wouldn't um, get discouraged if toddlers aren't wanting to sit tight for uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. So you want to just start the practice of kids enjoying family dinner and looking forward to it. I think toddlers can um, participate in the um, preparing of the meal. You know, they can, uh, they can have their own Tupperware that they play with as the cook that night is also preparing. They can um, stir the soup. They can uh, crumble the cheese. So those are some ways. They can um, maybe make some, uh, draw a picture of the family as a placemat and help set the table that way. Um, I think there are several games that toddlers might particularly enjoy, like uh, asking them to close their eyes at the table and then ask them without peeking, can you remember the color, the paint color of our kitchen wall? Uh, do you know what uh, daddy is wearing today? Um, do you know what's in the corner of the table? Um, so that might be a game. Or would you rather, I think, uh, is a silly, fun game that kids of all ages, but I think starting with toddlers can enjoy. You know, would you rather be able to fly or swim underwater without worrying about holding your breath? Would you rather eat rice for the rest of your life or eat bread for the rest of your life? You know, these are games. This is a game that a toddler, I think, could sink her her teeth into. Um, and again, on the website, you can look at um, games and search by age um, and just look at toddler games. There, there are probably a dozen or so toddler games. Great. Those are cute ideas. Um, our next question, uh, this person has teenagers and they spend a lot of time arguing about manners at the dinner table. If not at dinner, when should the family share this feedback? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> so just the view from 30,000 feet about teenagers, um, I think a lot of parents, and I'm not hearing that in this question, but a lot of parents think, oh, my teenagers don't want to eat with me anymore. They'd rather eat in front of their screens or with their friends. But actually, it turns out that uh, when big groups of teens are surveyed, they say they would much rather eat with their families than by themselves or with peers. And they also say that dinner is the time they're most likely to talk to their parents, with the car being the second most common time. So um, even if it's frustrating or difficult, it's, you know, it, it should be embraced having family dinner with, with teenagers. And of course, they have perhaps the most to gain uh, because of the risk reduction of um, a lot of behaviors that are associated with having regular family dinners, like lower rates of substance abuse and tobacco use. But I'm trying not to ask the manners question, answer the manners question. So I would say this about manners. I think the manners that are really worth spending time on at the table are those that encourage conversation, that encourage listening and talking. So things like, let's not interrupt, um, not 
talking with your mouth full. And these are also manners that parents can work on as well, which I think makes it easier with kids, with teenagers in particular. Um, and, you know, I think a, an occasional take your elbows off the table or don't eat with your fingers because that isn't so sanitary. You know, part of our job as parents is to civilize our children so they're safe to go out uh, and eat with other people. So, of course, we want to sort of pepper in some of those lessons on manners. But I think when it becomes the dominant conversation or it becomes every single night, it's, it's hard on parents who wants to be constantly monitoring and reprimanding. It really can suck the fun out of a family dinner. And for mm -hmm. kids, it's also not so much fun to always be told they're doing something wrong. So I guess my advice would be to focus on those essential manners that can be worked on by both parents and kids that have to do with talking and listening and the other manners to go easier on and to talk about occasionally. Great. Um, so I haven't seen any more questions come through. So we can wrap up a few minutes early, but thank you so much, Dr. Fischel. This is really great. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Okay.